Okay. Yes, we can start. Uh, friends, on behalf of Tamil Nadu Science Forum and Popular Science Lecture Group, I extend my warm welcome to you all. Today, we are going to have a webinar on Invisible Empire, how viruses and microbes shape up our world. This lecture shall be delivered by Mr. Pranay Lal. We have with us two pillars of uh, PSL, uh, Dr. TRG and uh, uh, Dr. S. Krishnasamy, and we are also expecting Dr. Ramanujam as well. This meeting shall be in English. We would like to have a brief introduction to Tamil Nadu Science Forum and the speaker, which shall be uh, done by um, Dr. Seth Raman. And Dr. Krishna Sami will be introducing the speaker. And speaker will, uh, Dr. Pranay, Mr. Pranay Lal. Pranay Lal will speak about 40 to 45 minutes and followed by we have a question answer session. Uh, finally, we have a word of thanks by Mr. Chella Kumar, our EC member. So we'll end up the meeting between somewhere between 5.30 to 6 o'clock. Um, so if questions are not coming, we will we'll close it a little bit earlier to um, facilitate the speaker to attend another meeting. The PSL is part of Tamil Nadu Science Forum and it is started functioning in 2018, although the TSF is, uh, TNSF is functioning from 1980 onwards. PSL came into existence when we decided to strengthen our activities of TNSF in higher science area. We have conducted 46 lecture and this is the 47th lecture. Uh, this is held, um, this is being held to celebrate the National Science Day, which falls on 28th February. So 28th February being the weekday, we don't, we are not able to have a meeting on that day. We don't have, we don't, we, we, we normally we used to have the meetings only in weekends. Uh, the first lecture of PSL was held in July 2018 as the Stephen Hawkins Memorial Lecture. PSL used to have its uh, lecture in the hall and it adapted to virtual meetings uh, during the pandemic time. So we hope that we will have a few more virtual meetings until uh, all the restrictions are over. <clears throat> Some of the participants are shown by the device name. We request them to change their name by right-clicking the icon and entering your actual name. We'll mute all the mics except the speakers and request all of you to raise your hand when you have questions. When the question answer session starts, we may unmute the mic and uh, for those who wish to ask direct questions to the speaker. So with this, we would like to get a feedback from the webinar uh, from you. Uh, and we have posted a Google form. I'm going to provide the Google form in the uh, chat window. Please fill up the form and uh, uh, by providing your contact details and your opinion of this program. We'll keep you in, contact, um, uh, in touch uh, to send the details about the um, future programs. We also have the Telegram group meant for PSL. To join the Telegram group, we are going to provide a link in the chat window. You just click the link and become a member of our Telegram group. You can also send a mail to uh, popular hyphen science hyphen lectures plus subscribe at googlegroups.com to become a member of our Google group. We also broadcast this lecture in YouTube. If any of you drop from this meeting due to any reason and unable to get into the meeting, you can watch this uh, webinar in the YouTube and we are going to provide the YouTube link in the chat window as well. You can save it separately so that you can get into the meeting quickly. So with this, let me hand over the mic to Dr. Seyad Raman to introduce the Tamil Nadu Science Forum. Dr. Seyad Raman, please. No, yes, not, yeah. yes, not turned up, right? Okay. Uh, um, uh, I think you can go ahead and start straightly, you know, right? Yes, uh, Dr. Krishna Sami will talk about the speaker and he'll also, part of Science Forum, he can introduce the Science Forum as well. Thank you. Dr. S.K. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Pranay Lal on behalf of Tamil Nadu Science Forum. Tamil Nadu Science Forum itself, as uh, uh, Vijayan had pointed out, has been existing uh, for more than 35 years. And uh, it uh, initially started as a a small group of uh, researchers and uh, uh, students from uh, university uh, in the university in Chennai, and then uh, 
uh, it has grown subsequently during the total literacy campaign to cover the entire state of Tamil Nadu and uh, now has uh, uh, functionaries in all districts of Tamil Nadu and uh, uh, it has uh, broadened its activities apart from science communication to a variety of other activities to uh, intervene in the intersection of science and society. And uh, so, uh, so it's a great pleasure that uh, uh, such a personality as uh, Pranay Lal is uh, a able to uh, be here and address our, uh, both our Tamil Nadu Science Forum uh, people as well as the PSL uh, members who are there. Uh, Pranay Lal uh, is a very versatile and interesting personality. No, uh, I would uh, think that no, it is, I was quite surprised to, uh, I came across Pranay Lal because of his book Indica and then subsequently the uh, Invisible Empire. And uh, uh, he was trained in uh, microbiology in, uh, did his BSc in 91 from Mumbai, then his MSc in biochemistry in 92 from Mumbai, and then went on to do his uh, masters in environment and forestry from Oxford University in 96. Uh, and then interestingly they had a, a short training in uh, virology from the famous Dunn School of Pathology at Oxford. And then uh, also got a certificate in epidemiology in 2011 uh, from the Union and Medicine Science Frontiers, which is a well-known organization. So uh, just as his uh, uh, early uh, education has been quite uh, uh, varied, you will see his experience is also quite uh, interesting that uh, for more than eight, uh, six years, uh, from 1986, he was a visualizer, animator, freelance caricaturist for national newspapers. And uh, then uh, for about two years, uh, he was uh, uh, no, uh, in the, as part of the Voluntary Health Association Maharashtra, uh, did a part-time work on door-to-door -door childhood immunization survey. Uh, then subsequently uh, for two years, in, uh, he was in Delhi, as a consultant for the UNCTAD. Uh, then I went on to also become uh, a project coordinator for the Global March Against Child Labor. So you will see that all along he has been in touch with people as well as in overall the fringe of the, I mean, the intersection of science and uh, people. And uh, then uh, he uh, went on to become a coordinator of the health and environment section of the Center for Science and Environment that he was there for three years. Uh, then he became, uh, he was a policy advisor in the advocacy control of TB International, uh, that's for a year. And then he was for two years as a director of policy in the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. And uh, then from 2007 onwards, he's been a senior technical advisor at the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, also popularly called the Union. And uh, so uh, with his uh, daytime full-time uh, job, uh, he's uh, also managed to take a new avatar as a science writer and communicator. And in that sense, he's a, a model example for uh, Tamil Nadu Science Forum uh, people. And this uh, debut in Plix was the book Indica, uh, Deep Natural History of the Indian Subcontinent. That was published by Penguin and went on to become a best book in the Delhi Book Fair in 2017 and also got listed as among the top non-fiction books in 2017. I read that book and it's really amazing, especially the way he takes through the entire, from the early uh, years of formation of the earth, all through, and he shows examples of what places in India. You no, know, that's something remarkable I found. And not only that, there's a visual context that he gives a latitude and longitude, so you can actually go to Google Maps and look at that place. You know, even, so it's a very nice uh, uh, attempt. And, no, I've not seen this type of writing earlier. And uh, then in 2021, he came out uh, after the pandemic uh, with the in Invisible Empire, the Natural History of Viruses, which is what he's going to be uh, talking to us about. But this book also got listed as a top non-fiction book in 2021 from a Hindu and uh, a review by uh, Professor Shahid Jamil, who has been uh, written an extremely nice review about it, which is available in the wire and people should try and look at it. Uh, so it's a uh, great pleasure that uh, I uh, welcome uh, uh, Pranay Lal and uh, look forward to his talk along with others. Thank you, Mr. Pranay Lal. Uh, thank you, Professor Krishna Swami and all the friends in TNSF. Uh, I'm quite humbled to be here. 
Uh, I hope uh, that uh, you know the the luminaries you've had uh, speaking with you. I'm hope I hope that I would be able to uh, you know do justice uh, to the expectations that you have. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, you know, try making a case here that the microbial world and within that the viruses have a very important role in the, the in the role of uh, keeping a balance in nature. But before we do that, I just wanted to take you through a short journey of where we are in terms of viruses, or rather, in 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 sense of where where we are in terms of uh, you know the whole process of diseases. I just, uh, uh, you're very kind in introducing me uh, on my two books. And uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, the, f- the book on the left is about the natural history of the subcontinent, uh, uh, the Indian subcontinent. And my more, most recent book, which has been released in November of last year, is on the natural history of viruses. So I'm interested in the entire gamut of influences on and influences off creatures, landforms, landscapes, and everything. So I think uh, my interest is to understand the larger gamut in which things exist. I'm going to take a, a quick dive into an uh, image of this kind. Um, until 2018, uh, you know, we were quite complacent by the fact that we were making amazing discoveries in the field of biotechnology. Uh, please recall that uh, the Nobel Prize for 2018 went to somebody who discovered, uh, two ladies who discovered uh, uh, a fascinating new technique that could leapfrog advancement in uh, diagnosis and creation of new therapeutic uh, strategies. Uh, That was uh, uh, Professor uh, Jennifer Dunna and uh, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier uh, for the discovery of the CRISPR model. But just a year later, the same processes that we were harnessing and looking at the bacterial and the microbial world and the viral world suddenly brought us back to uh, a stage where we were looking at the microbes and in particular the viruses with a different set of uh, vision. And it brought me back to this uh, caricature or cartoon uh, of an 1880 encyclopedia of Remedies for the good, uh, uh, good wife. This is what the English translation of this encyclopedia is, and it's basically remedies of hygiene and medicine for a, uh, a wife to manage at home. And it actually shows uh, three children: one with scarlet fever, the other with measles, and the third with smallpox. And basically, what it tells is that how should you manage conditions like this? In In this period, in in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, we had no clue what uh, viruses were and we had only just started discovering bacteria. Uh, Remember that the first virus was seen only in the 1930s and uh, there was no way in which we could have figured out which creature caused what. But the fact of the matter is that as the pandemic has grown uh, over and over again, our attitudes towards anything that is microscopic has again become very medieval or rather primitive. We now call every creature, uh, you know, we'll castigate them with uh, with an eye of vengeance, vengeance and we do not uh, have any uh, 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 understanding of what roles these creatures or these life forms play in the natural world. So with this background, I'm going to position five, uh, uh, I'll make five submissions to you on why we need microbes if we want to survive. But before we embark on that, I want to tell you what is the microbial world. Now, if I were to take a pinch of soil from a bird bath or from a pond, uh, you know, and, and I was to put this in a microscope, under a microscope, this is what I would see. The chances are that I would see a worm which is very, very tiny, uh, barely visible to the eye, but under the microscope, it looks like a giant. Now, this worm is called a nematode. Now, it is the most abundant uh, metazoan or a multicellular creature in the world. They, there's an estimate which says there are 57 billion nematodes for every human on Earth. 
They're so numerous that they're found in just about every soil sample from the Antarctica to the equatorial spaces and even on the fringes of the oceans and seas. So it's a very elegant creature to see under a microscope. You could watch it for hours. It's very, very beautiful to watch them. But if I were to look a little further, I would come across these slipper-shaped creatures, which we know as paramecians. You could find its other protozoal cousins like amoeba, chlamydomonas. The other creatures also are pretty visible. But sharpening my vision under the microscope, I then come into a solitary creature. This algal cell, which is called micra asterias. Micra means small, asterias means sun. So it looks like a small sun. And under refracted light, it gives you these beautiful glowing colors. I then sharpen my vision by tenfold again, and then come to see something like this. The gray blotches that you see in front, they look like small flowers, as if you're lying down in the grass and you're looking at the sun. And so it looks like uh, heads of flowers and grass. And at the background, looks what looks like a circular sun is actually uh, a cell of Saccharomyces, which is uh, from the family of yeasts. The creature in front is Aspergillus. Now, Aspergillus can do a lot of damage. There are some two species of Aspergillus which are extremely pathogenic to human beings. But the other 80 known Aspergillus are actually very beneficial because they, they are known to uh, break down uh, so certain complex proteins with many other bacteria or other creatures are not able to do. So this is the performance, the, 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 the utility function of, uh, of uh, Aspergillus, which is very important that we must also understand. But if I were to just focus again on the yeast cell, the Saccharomyces, and if I were to look at uh, something that infects uh, the Saccharomyces, that creature would be a, uh, uh, something that eats a bacteria, what is called a bacteriophage. Now, bacterio is, as you know, from the word bacterium, and phage is to eat, as in phagey, right? So a, a virus that kills and feeds on uh, a bacteria is called a bacteriophage. Now, this is largely the spectrum of creatures that you find in, uh, in, a, in a small pinch of soil, a moist soil from a pond. Uh, of course, you need different kinds of microscope. I've been very simplistic in saying that, you know, you could see the worm and you could see the virus in the same field. Chances are that you will have to keep changing your microscope because the power of the microscope uh, is different. The point that I want to tell you here is that uh, even in the microscopic world, the size is uh, of immense diversity. On the right of the screen, you see uh, uh, a hair, a human hair. And towards the center, you see these two red uh, disc-shaped uh, uh, objects, which is the red blood cell. Uh, move along that line towards the left further, and you see these two blue sausage-shaped uh, uh, things, and those are bacterium. Next to the bacterium, to the left, is the smallest known particle, uh, which is commonly seen. It's not the smallest known as, uh, I mean, what I, I mean in the sense that it is commonly seen is wood smoke. Wood smoke particles, as you know, are very, very, fine. And about a quarter of a size of a wood smoke particle is a coronavirus. Now, coronavirus is among the larger viruses that we know, but it's still not the largest virus. But um, there are several smaller viruses that are on to, on to the left. You remember what I told you about bacteriophage, the eater of bacteria? Now, that is next to the, uh, to the left on uh, the, the coronavirus. And further left to that uh, is uh, another virus that we that's become notorious is the Zika virus, right? So what I'm trying to show here is that the spectrum, the size diversity, even within the microbial world is immense. But let's look at some giant viruses. You know, when I've said that there are viruses that are pretty large, uh, here's one example. So in 1992, in the town of Bradford, which is about 300 kilometers north of London, uh, it's, it is in a city called Yorkshire, uh, sorry, a county called Yorkshire, the city of Bradford. Yorkshire, as you know, many of you know, uh, was made famous by, uh, I mean, we Indians know Yorkshire because of Jeffrey Boycott. I mean, he was a, a, a player from the county of Yorkshire. And he used to, uh, you know, live uh, not too far from the town where this uh, 
creature was discovered. Now, the reason why we're talking about this creature, and I'm not labeling it yet, is because in 1992, uh, there was a mysterious pneumonia that was started to take place in, uh, in a ward in a hospital of Bradford, the city of Bradford. And for the person who discovered it in the cooling towers uh, of the hospital, uh, decided to isolate it and tried culturing it. Now, culturing uh, is a term that is used in medicine and in microbiology to try growing something. Uh, you try growing an organism in its, uh, uh, you know, so that you can make more of it and you can do more experiments. So that process is called culturing. And you also try to separate other creatures, other microbes from it. So in the effort to identify what this uh, microbe was, uh, the effort uh, to isolate it uh, proved futile because it just do, did not grow. But it was found in large numbers in the water of the water cooler that was there, uh, the water cooling plant that was there on the top of the roof of the hospital in Bradford. When you do, do uh, staining of these cells, uh, uh, it picked up two colors. Now, let me just explain what staining is. In microbiology, there's something called gram staining. It's named after a Danish scientist by the name of Graham. Now, you use two different uh, dyes. One is a blue dye and one is a pink dye. And if the bacterial cell picks up the pink uh, color, then it is Graham negative. And if it picks up the blue color, then it is called Graham positive. But in this case, the, 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 the micro picked up both the colors. Now, as a result, the, the scientist who found this uh, microbe was very confused. And he said, how can a bacteria or any creature that gets stained pick up both the colors? So he was unable to, um, um, to label it or even say that this is a bacteria or a virus or a fungus or anything. He just was not sure what it was. But, but he gave it a loose name called uh, Bradford Cocos, Brad, uh, the, the town of Bradford and Cocos being uh, cocci, are called, round uh, bacterial cells are called cocci. Because this is uh, pretty much round, uh, not as round as most cocci are, but it was round enough for him to classify it as a cocus. So at the same time, in 1993, 1994, the National Health Services of uh, the, the UK government was under a severe financial crisis. And all, this, all research of this kind was uh, seized. Uh, this scientist decided to send uh, these samples to um, some collaborators in France. And a couple of years later, in 1996, um, the collaborators decided to take out this uh, frozen sample and wanted to see what it was. And for a very long time, in, under a simple microscope, they could see nothing. They were seeing exactly what their British colleague had seen. But once they uh, uh, looked at through uh, electronic uh, microscope or electron microscope, they found that it actually contained what looked like giant viruses. Now, since then, since 1996, several places, including IIT Bombay, has discovered giant viruses within uh, the cell. They were also intrigued what the cell was. So it was found that the host, the cell that uh, the virus was infecting, was actually an amoeba. It's a primitive amoeba called acantho amoeba. It can cause, uh, some acantho amoebas are capable of causing a severe uh, and pretty lethal form of uh, conjunctivitis. When I say lethal, it can damage your cornea, uh, not cause death, but damage the, the cornea. But uh, what uh, this discovery told us is that some bacteria, uh, sorry, some viruses are so large that they can be simply seen under a, a light microscope if infected in a host cell like uh, the amoeba. But what the other implication was that giant viruses also tell us about some history about how perhaps viruses evolved. I won't go into the history of the evolution of viruses because that's a very complex and a long conversation. Uh, I would encourage you to buy a copy of my book. I'm sorry I'm being shameless in promoting my book, but it's uh, just to put it very simply, um, you know, the, the viruses evolved perhaps in multiple trajectories and in very divergent ways. So what we know now is that viruses are of an incredible variety. They come in different shapes and sizes and they, they have no color. So the 
images of coronaviruses, for example, that you're seeing blue and green and red and orange are actually not uh, colored. At least they're so tiny that even a ray of light can pass through them. So how is it that a particle or something that is as small as a particle uh, should uh, contain a color? Even if they do contain a color, they just would not refract light. And but from the evolutionary perspective, what is the benefit of having color? The, the pigment that would endow color on the cell surface or within the outer exterior of a virus has no purpose because viruses themselves can't see and they don't have super predators of their own which need to see color. So the idea that viruses are colored or not colored is actually something that needs to be dismissed and kept away. Uh, when you see a colorful image of uh, a coronavirus or any other virus, uh, remember that it's only for scientists because those who are designing uh, vaccines need to know where the spike proteins are and what uh, and how are they different from other proteins, envelope proteins, capsids, capsomeres, you know, all the technical aspects that go into the exterior and interior in making of the virus. In, in all its, uh, in its perspective, a virus should contain no color, right? But the other factor that we now know from the understanding of viruses is that they have an incredible variety of genetic material. Viruses can be both RNA and DNA. And to complicate things, they can be uh, viruses what are called uh, double-stranded or single-stranded. And to make matter, matters even more complicated, there's something called positively sensed and negatively sensed. Now, with such complexity, despite being such tiny and simple creatures, these uh, viruses have been, you know, now being considered as something that is potential of being alive. Until now, it was being considered as a dead particle. But now taxonomists have actually accorded it in the tree of life, a place in the, at, the, at the base of the tree of life. Uh, the second thing that has happened, uh, which the taxonomists now understand, is that the complexity of viruses is such that it defies the linear classification of the seven ranks of linear classification. They've added uh, eight more tiers or ranks to the seven tiered uh, linear system. So basically viruses have 15 ranks in all. And that's the enormity of the complexity of the viral world. And this is the reason why I call this, uh, this book an invisible empire. I don't call it a kingdom. I don't call it a domain. I call viruses an empire because for every known life form, for every known creature, there is certainly one virus. And if there are 400 odd known viruses that infect human beings, then think about how many others exist for say, other large complex mammals like cows, dogs, cats, they would be in nature an equal number, if not more. And certain other uh, microbes, for example, um, the common gut bacteria called Escherichia coli has 80 different var varieties of, and strains and species of viruses that can infect it. So the complexity of the entire problem of classifying viruses is is huge. Let me just deep dive into the five propositions I want to make to you. My first proposition is that if microbes did not exist, you and I would not be able to breathe. So let me make this very, um, uh, you know, candid and upfront for you that how, why is it that I'm making such a uh, uh, impossible uh, uh, proposition? So the first thing I want to show you is some of you must have seen this. This is the reclining Vishnu. As you know, in Hindu legend, uh, Vishnu is the preserver of life. Now, Vishnu is gazing, in this case, uh, at a pond which is very still. And on top of that pond is a layer of what we call slime, but it is an extremely rich community of blue-green bacteria. Now, blue-green bacteria were among the first creatures to evolve on the face of the earth. They were so, in, so, so important, they created all the free oxygen that we breathe today. So much so that about 3.7 billion years ago, they started to partner with other creatures, other single-celled organisms that were specialists in, new, uh, in utilizing uh, materials like nutrients or elements. And together with them, they found colonies like this. 
This is called a stromatolite. Now, stromatolites uh, used to uh, dot the entire uh, landscape wherever land and water met in the uh, in the ancient times when there were no other creatures except single-celled creatures. Now, what has happened since is that for from the period uh, between 3.7 billion years till about uh, uh, 700 million years, for, for about 3 billion years, the single-celled animals were the dominant creatures on, on the face of the earth. And during that time, these single-celled creatures produced so much oxygen that they first started to create uh, metal oxides and different types of oxides that were before this period absent on the face of the earth. The second thing that did was to create the atmosphere and more importantly, the ozone layer. And third, they orchestrated so much production of oxygen that it caused the earth to freeze many times. In fact, uh, for several uh, millions of years, the earth looked like a snowball. It was frozen till the equator. It would have appeared from the space, not like the blue, 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 green, uh, brown colored planet, but a completely white ball uh, of snow. And it was only volcanic activities that liberated the earth from its, uh, the, the ice uh, that had uh, uh, surrounded it. And uh, once liberated, uh, that massive if event about 750 million years ago, uh, led to the uh, evolution of the uh, macroscopic world, the, what are called the metazoans. And it was the oxygen and the availability of new nutrients that uh, spurred the evolution of more complex creatures other than these single-celled creatures. Now, having historically made uh, such massive contributions, uh, stromatolites, and more specifically, blue-green bacteria in all their variety uh, contribute to oxygen production and more importantly, to carbon sinking. I want to show you this map. We know that 70% of the Earth's surface is actually covered, uh, is covered with water. The first eight meters of the oceans and seas are, are teeming with a microscopic uh, blue-green bacteria like uh, I'm sorry, I got muted for some reason. Oh, yeah, yes. Don't worry, it's okay. So, um, so the eight meters of oceans and seas is actually full of uh, uh, microscopic uh, blue-green algae, which on during the day capture carbon to produce uh, uh, carbohydrates. And by night, uh, there is uh, predation and there is uh, also replication of these, uh, uh, these uh, blue-green bacteria. So when the predation happens and if these uh, creatures are killed, they go and sink in the deep oceans. I want to particularly bring to your notice the following, yeah, the following uh, bacteria, the blue-green uh, bacteria. The, on the left is the champion called the prochlorococcus. Pro means first, chloro means green, coccus means um, uh, rounded cells. And its cousin is synechococcus. Now, together, both these uh, blue-green bacteria produce all the free oxygen, about, sorry, about 25% of the world's free oxygen is produced by just these two organisms. And there are about uh, a thousand more blue-green bacteria that survive in different other uh, water bodies. Why are these two in particular so important is because in the oceans, they have specific viruses. And these viruses are predators and they, they, they actually infect the prochlorococcus and synechococcus. And as they are doing that, they also uh, trigger the reproduction uh, process in these bacteria. So while the process of killing is happening, the reproduction also is happening simultaneously. So the mother cell is about to die and it produces two two or three or four daughter cells, and they, and they survive to continue the process of capturing carbon. But as the mother cell dies, she goes down and sinks in the bottom of the oceans, thereby capturing carbon. But 
during the process of its survival, the, the single bacterial cell has produced enough oxygen up on the surface of the oceans, which then travels all over the world. I just want to emphasize the, the fact that the blue-green bacteria contribute significantly to carbon capture and production of oxygen. And this is something that is hugely underappreciated when we talk about uh, the environment. We only believe about environment when we talk about trees and grasses and uh, you know uh, large forests. The true forests of the world which are really contributing in terms of protecting the climate or keeping a balance on the carbon dioxide and the oxygen levels are the blue-green bacteria in water bodies. To the, to the uh, center is another microbe called trichodesmium. Now that is singularly the largest contributor to the nitrogen cycle. It balances the nitrogen cycle in any water body. So while on the surface of, of land in terrestrial ecosystems, you have uh, um, organisms like rhizobiums and nostocs that work with root systems, trichodesmium works individually to capture nitrogen and manage the amount of nitrogen that has to be uh, circulating in the oceans and the rivers and from there onto the soil systems. To the right is microcystis, which is a crucial microbe to, which manages the sulfur cycle in the world. So I'm just showing you a very, very small number of creatures which are important and they're specific ones for just about every other important mineral. The reason why I'm showing you this is because on the just below that are their respective uh, uh, viruses that actually cause their death. And with their death, the whole cycle of the minerals and the elements that has to be kept in balance is, uh, is coordinated. So in the oceans and also on soil systems and, and even on the tops of trees, this massive churning of minerals and elements and, uh, and, and um, uh, compounds is happening because the microbial systems are working in tandem. And it is essential that we respect and conserve the, the forests and the oceans and the rivers, not only for their beauty, but also for the sanctity of the processes of the, na of the natural world. I want to now come to the second point that I want to make. Had, the, had viruses and the microbial world not been there, you and I would have evolved very differently. Let me take you to the depths of the Indian Ocean, where this creature on the left is, uh, a, it's a fish. It's called the coelocanth. Now, the coelocanth was discovered in the early 1930s, and it was uh, considered a dinosaurian fish. In fact, it's been there for 410 million years, or even slightly earlier. Now, something happened to an uh, ancestor of the coelocanth, which caused its fins to become muscular and its tail to become muscular. Now, what is remarkable about the coelocanth, it li lives in the deep seas, but it, it has been noticed that it does not use its uh, fins like a normal fish. It is not a fast moving fish. It is actually very, very slow. And why is it slow? It's because there is no competition for it or no predator in the place where it lives. It lives in submarine caves in near volcanic islands and there it is seen to be crawling and walking and grappling with, uh, with its fins and its, uh, and its uh, muscular tail. Uh, and it uh, feeds on small creatures and, uh, and uh, uh, small uh, microscopic plants uh, that are found in the uh, rich uh, but dark environment uh, of volcanic uh, submarine caves. Now, what we know is that these muscular fins and tails became the prototype of how the limb of the amphibians or the first creature that left water. It, we know this from two creatures. It's from this and this fish called coelocanth and another fish called lungfish. Now, how did this uh, fin become muscular? So if you were to look at uh, fish that were the predecessors of the coelocanth or the lungfish, we find that they do not have the, of course, the muscular fin. The muscular fin developed because of a virus that infected the ancestor or a, or a pre, uh, predecessor 
of the uh, coelacanth. And the image that on the right is that of the virus. It's called a foamy virus. It's called a foamy virus because it produces foam when it infects a tissue. It's only after foamy viruses get embedded in the DNA, in this case of an ancestor of a coelacanth, it caused it to produce something uh, a phys uh, which was of importance or, or relevance for that fish to survive. And in this case, it endowed it with muscular fins and a very strong muscular tail. Now, subsequent infections of foamy viruses enabled the amphibians to start to take the first step out of water and colonize land. So the first vertebrates eventually started to colonize land because of foamy viruses infecting them, right? Now, that's not the whole story. I want to take you back about 255 million years ago. Now, about two, uh, this is the time when all the coal and petrol that is in India or in Australia or Brazil or South Africa was being formed. This is an age called the Permian. It's the Permian age. And on the left is the ancestor of uh, of uh, the modern amphibians. In fact, this is the largest living uh, amphibian. The when, when I say amphibian, uh, you must remember that th this is something which is related to the frogs, right? Now, think about such giant frogs, slightly uh, bigger than your auto rickshaw, right? Uh, in fact, much bigger than your auto rickshaw. To the top right is a reptile, uh, the ancestors of uh, the crocodile. But the story that I want to tell you is the creature that is on the bottom right. It's called a Thrinaxodon. Uh, we found fossils of Thrinaxodon in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana and some parts of Odisha as well. Um, what is remarkable about this creature is that it is a true reptile, uh, but it's got features uh, which are bit like mammal. Now, if you notice its uh, face, it's got two eyes which are large and, uh, you know, they're surrounded by scales. Its teeth, the fossils that, that have been discovered so far, have been hollow, quite like that of snakes or, or, or lizards, you know, especially poisonous um, uh, reptiles which have hollow teeth uh, to accommodate uh, the, the, the injection of the venom. Uh, their claws on the on the feet and the tail are both scaly and very much like reptiles. But notice that its ear is external and large and prominent, and it's got uh, hair on its back or hair-like uh, protrusions, which is of interest. Now, what we know from genetic studies is that sometime around this time, there was another infection of another virus that caused a divergence in the reptiles to create a family called the mammal-like reptiles. Now, the mammal-like reptiles were frequently infected to form the true mammals, our super ancestors. But it was the mammal-like reptiles which later became the ancestors of the platypus and the echidna. And you know, the egg-laying mammals that are found in Australia and some other parts of the world. Um, what is interesting is that the placenta, the reason why we are able to produce uh, children with live birth is because of this viral infection. Now, I want to show you, many of you may not have seen what a placenta looks like. A placenta is an incredible organ. Placenta is an alien organ. It is not found in uh, the female of the males of the mammalian species. Now, what it does is that there is, and the, when, when the act of conception begins, um, a protein is triggered from a gene which is of a viral origin. Now that gene and that protein are the ones that start to orchestrate the production of a placenta. But as soon as the placenta becomes the home for the fetus, it is uh, another viral uh, va um, a gene that protects it from being uh, exited out or, or, or expu uh, expunged out. Uh, because in some uh, women, as you must have uh, heard, there are something called spontaneous abortions. That's because although the uh, woman has begun the process of conception and she is pregnant, the pregnancy does not hold because there is rejection by the immune system of the, uh, the, uh, of the woman. 
right? Now to control the immune system from reacting against a protein which is of viral origin, there, there has to be another viral uh, uh, instigation and a viral uh, uh, protein, action of a viral protein to protect it from being rejected from the body. So isn't this amazing that the whole thing that you and I are actually assemblages of virus? Now, in 2007 and 8, when the Human Genome Project started to bring up its data, it found that 8% of human DNA is made out of viral genes, or at least genes that are not found in our predecessors or any other close mammal relatives. And the same was found for other mammals also, that a very significant proportion of the DNA is of viral origin. And what, do, what does that serve? It serves many purposes, uh, including making our placenta. And think about it, had we not had a placenta, you and I just now would be talking in, uh, you know, in, in bird talk. You know, I would be chirping and you could be croaking and somebody could be cawing and somebody could be saying something else, right? So it is very, very important that we remember that our birth and the process of how we are born is also viral in origin. And finally, I'm going to come to another point uh, on how viruses help us in defense. You must be thinking, oh, viruses only cause disease. Well, that's not true. We have more viruses in our body than we imagine. In fact, there are more viruses in your body that you will ever encounter, which are uh, as fevers or, or infections that will cause you discomfort or disease. There is now a, 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 you know, an understanding that there is a virus in just about every part of your body. What was once considered to be sterile is now uh, a, a place where you may encounter a virus, including your uh, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, just about every part of your uh, of your of your body, and if you, and even your blood, your kidneys, your liver, all fluids contain some forms of viruses. What is what is important for us to remember is that. Uh, uh, viruses like this one, this beautiful uh, polygonal virus, it's something that we all contain. We might, we we have at least two or maybe five, and some people even eight species of this virus. Now it's something that we encountered as children. It's called the herpes virus. It uh, in as in our childhood, it would have impacted us and caused um, uh, chickenpox. Uh, but once we grow up, it uh, uh, causes something very painful. What is called herpes zoster or shingles. It's very painful condition in one half of your body. You find this burning sensation with small uh, uh, pustules or, or small uh, boils on your one part of your body. Um, now, herpes uh, as a family, although it does cause disease, but it also uh, roams around in your body. It, it just circulates all across your body fluids and causes your uh, uh, body to be primed for any immune uh, deficiencies and also uh, informs the immune structure of any uh, viral attack or even bacterial attacks that may potentially occur. So over the 7 billion, uh, so, sorry, 7 million years that have occurred uh, since our evolution of the, uh, our earliest ape ancestors, we have been exchanging viruses and microbes and even worms. And there are similarities, not only in the genes that was passed down from our earliest ancestors to us, but also a microbiome uh, and also a viral uh, uh, community, which also helped us uh, sustain and, and support uh, uh, our immune system and, and the way our physiology works. It's, a, it's, a, it's very crucial that we inherit a microbiome from our mothers. And it is very important that we get inoculated by the right kinds of bacteria and viruses and worms, right? There's another virus, a family of viruses called the aniloviruses. We are finding it now in very, very, very small numbers, but it's found in just about every uh, 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 individual. Uh, and most people carry it. Uh, what do aniloviruses do? They actually protect uh, people, especially when your immunity levels are low. 
And when bacteria and especially viruses are looking for an opportunity to cause you infection, it's the anneloviruses in your body which actually prevent you from getting infected. So you would notice that some people who have low immunity, but somehow does, do not catch fevers or colds or things like that. And there are some people who have low immunity and, but, and keep uh, continuously uh, contracting uh, fevers. And that's because the levels of perhaps anneloviruses or other defending viruses is also low. So having these circulating viruses within your body can actually do you, do, do you more good than harm. I'm going to come to my fourth proposition. If there are so many viruses all across, then how is it that they maintain order and in their absence, they cause disorder, right? So I'm going to give you an example. This is a structure of the human tongue. For a very long period of time, and if you were to talk to your dentist, I mean, I would encourage you, the next time you go to your dentist, ask him uh, how many bacteria, what kinds of bacteria live on in your mouth. And, you know, chances are they will name you two or maybe three. But, you know, there are at least 18 to uh, 30 species of just bacteria on your tongue and cheeks and teeth, right? Now, this is a cross-section with, a show, with you, you see the different colors. Now, these are different kinds of microbes that colonize your tongue. They not only protect your tongue from infections of more invasive features, but they also protect people like smokers and tobacco chewers and alcohol drinkers because all these can cause, as you know, cause cancer. But if these microbes were to die off very quickly, the chances of your cancer or, or an injury to your cells, which are exposed, the, the cells of your tongue or your cheek would be tremendous. So the, these microbes not only benefit from the food you eat, they are, they are also uh, very useful in terms of protecting you from any assault, especially the negative assaults that you get from uh, 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 injury and insults like smoking and drinking and chewing tobacco or eating very hot food or drinking something very sour. You know, all those things, uh, these microbes group together and... Uh, tend to uh, evade any in, uh, long lasting injury to your tongue and mouth, right? So what is uh, interesting is until the late 1990s, uh, medical texts used to tell that the dominant creature in the human gut is this creature called Escherichia coli, E. coli. Now it's a vital organism. It was one of the earliest bacteria and perhaps the most studied bacteria because it's a model bacteria that is uh, used by microbiologists for studies. But what we know is that E. coli is a very, very important organism because it helps in uh, assimilating and digesting a lot of different kinds of food, but it also is an important producer of vitamin K in, in the human body. So it's a very important creature to have in your gut. But what we now know is that, that E. coli is not at all dominant in the human gut. In fact, it is less than 1% of the total volume. So the human body is made out of 1 trillion cells, okay? We have 1 trillion cells of our own, but there are 1.3 trillion bacteria and worms and protozoa and other creatures. We don't know how many viruses are there, but you know, just the bacterial and other microbes are roughly 30% more than our own cells, right? And during that process of discovery, we discovered that we were wrong also about what is there in our gut. Our gut, when I say our gut, it's everything that's uh, the lower stomach until the intestine. That's the region which is called the gut, right? Now, the most uh, abundant creatures are these ones. And it again, depends on your diet. If you are a meat eater and a milk drinker, chances and you don't take as much uh, fruit and vegetables as you should, then you have a dominance of a, of a, a bacteria called bacterioides. But if you, are, if you take some more, um, you take less meats and uh, less milk, but also take uh, uh, a little more fruits and vegetables, then you have another uh, large number of viruses called Prevotella. And if you take more fiber and uh, largely vegetarian, chances of you having bacterioides in your guts is much lower, but you will have more ruminococcus 
and Prevotella and Escherichia coli. And therefore, meat eaters have slightly less bacteroides in terms of proportions. The point that I'm making here is that these, these bacteria, the four dominant bacteria of the, of the human gut, are critical in the way food gets digested. The, the stomach and the intestines alone do not digest it. It's these micro workers working overtime when, we are, when we've had a hearty dinner. Uh, it's these microbes that are working overtime. But with so much activity in your stomach, why is it that your stomach doesn't burst? Why is it that the, the bacteria, which are competing for food and growth and want to elbow out other bacteria, why is it that our stomachs don't burst at night? You know, that's a question that I used to have when I was a child, that I've got so many organisms in my stomach. Why is it my stomach when I've eaten so much and my stomach does pain, but the next morning I, I used to expect that my food would be, you know, my stomach would be burst open and I, the food would be hanging around all the, on top of the roof and all around, all around the room. Well, it never happened. I mean, I was perhaps four or five years old, but now I've discovered that the bacteria live in harmony. And what is the creature that maintains the harmony? It's a virus that we discovered only in 2017. And this virus is so abundant that it was not seen for a very, very long time. And people did not even assume that we had viruses in our stomach. Think about it. 2017 is not too long ago. We discovered this virus quite by accident. Now, Genetics or genomic studies in particular are very, very interesting because if you take a sample of any biological material, say blood or saliva or stool or urine, you are able to find out the genes of every creature that has possibly uh, you know, passed through or has lived in or has been whose genes have got collected in that uh, body fluid. Now, in stool samples across the world, people were finding a huge number of viral gene, genes, you know, there were broken genes. So scientists uh, collaborated and decided to piece together what could be the genome of a virus that was so dominant in the, in the human gut. And they called it crass, uh, crass phage uh, uh, virus, you know, and it's a very strange name. So crass, it's basically CR in, written as small, which means cross CR is cross and ASS is assembly. So what they had done was they assembled this using computer programs and figured out what could be the, the genetic structure of the virus. And they started to look and they weren't sure where to look and how to look for it. And eventually just about everyone started seeing these viruses and they found so many of them. And they were able to say that the, the three dominant uh, uh, bacteria in our gut, you know, were controlled by these family of viruses. So crass phage, which is so integral to maintaining the, the stability of our stomachs, was largely because of the virus that is found in our stomach, right? So I just want to also bring to your notice another creature. Now, this is a, a bacterium called, uh, a bacilli called Ralstonia. Now, Ralstonia uh, was uh, perhaps rose to prominence in 1890 when bacterial wilt began to uh, emerge in uh, places where potato was being grown. Now, recall that potato had emerged in Peru and Brazil and you know the central uh, 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 South American uh, subcontinent, or rather the continent, and lots of plants were traded from Peru, Brazil. Argentina to all over the world. And in the soil traveled this microbe, this bacteria. Now, what was very important is that this bacteria has a very, very large collection of whip-like structures at one of its end, and it's called flagella. It makes them extremely motile. They are able to move very fast in, in microbial terms, right? It, it's very, very quick. It's, it's able to move and infect very quickly because of its speed. And it also enjoys dispersing when the rain falls on dry surface. So if uh, this bacteria is found on farmland or in forest area, it, uh, it tends to spread very quickly if it rains and there is a splatter and there is, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, raindrops and it goes, disperses itself faster and faster and gets carried by rainwater and it infects 
uh, the stem of plants. It is believed that about 9 or 12 plants in South America were affected in the 1880s by this uh, bacteria. But because of the commercialization and globalization of plants and plant species, there are now 400 species that get infected by Ralstonia. In fact, it is such a major crisis that Ralstonia is perhaps the first uh, and became only the second uh, uh, bacterium or agricultural bacterium to be listed in the US bioterror list. So it is such a massive threat to crops. Each year we lose about a billion dollars worth of potato because of this bacteria. And there are others, for example, strawberries and uh, apricots and uh, papaya, bananas. Bananas uh, are seriously affected by Ralstonia all across the world. So as Ralstonia spread across uh, sub, uh, you know, countries, they also found scientists that there are specific viruses that kill Ralstonia. So there is, a, there is a way out in which we can counter what is called uh, a bacterial fever. For every bacteria, like I mentioned earlier, there is a specific phage. A phage is a bacterial eater. It, so if we get a bacterial fever, which is recalcitrant, there is an answer and there is a remedy by which we can cure ourselves. In fact, uh, between the two world wars the, and before the discovery of antibiotics, the most efficient way to treat diarrhea and war wounds and burns was using phages. By that time, we had discovered what was the specific bacteria uh, that we could have isolated. We, our bacteri bacteriology had, uh, had uh, improved immensely. But what we had not found yet was a virus. But there was something in the fluid when uh, scientists were working. They found that certain fluids, uh, human body fluids or animal body fluids, or even in nature, they found uh, uh, certain properties in fluids that contained particles that could kill these bacteria. They did not know what to call it, which we now know are, are basically uh, ultrafine particles or viruses. Now, these viruses are the ones that science hopes to reharness uh, and something that we can use to overcome antimicrobial resistance. So, I'm just going to go very quickly to my final slides. Uh, I know I'm running a little late. My fifth and final submission to you is that all the beauty that we have around us, the one of symmetry, the one of uh, accentuated uh, uh, morphism and physiology is largely bestowed by, by viruses. Now, let me make my case to you. We, this is how a wild tulip looks like. You know, uh, a tulip... Uh, its native uh, uh, range is uh, in the in the Altai Mountains of Kazakhstan, but it went westwards first to Turkey and then it came into India, where the Mughal Gardens in the 1500s was were growing this. But around the 1600s, uh, it uh, became very popular in Europe and especially in Holland, where it's still very popular. But in Holland, there was something else that happened to these flowers: a viral infection a virus called, strangely called the Poti virus. Poti, P-O-T-Y, stands for potato Y virus. But it was found in apricots and cherries and uh, other uh, fruit trees, which was had the ability to infect tulips. In fact, it created such a craze that it, uh, it became of immense economic value. Tulips became the first economic bubble of the globalized world in the 16th century. It caused the minor collapse of the Dutch economy because everybody uh, who had a little bit of wealth wanted to buy the fanciest tulips, the most beautifully colored and the most um, uh, exotic colors and shapes and designs were, uh, were fetching astronomical prices. In fact, a single bulb of tulip could be worth three ships laden with gold and silk and spices coming from India and Africa. That's the price that uh, merchants and kings in Holland were willing to pay in the 1630s. But then for different economic and biological reasons, 
the whole system collapsed. There was one year in which uh, the number of uh, uh, tulips flooded the market. The, there was overproduction and the quality of tulips was uh, not as uh, good as the previous seasons. And finally, the number of people who bet on the tulips were found that uh, their money was sinking. And as a result, lots of people went into debt and there was a crisis because even ships that were coming laden with uh, silks and linen and spices from the Indies, uh, there was nobody to buy it because everybody had run into debt. So what drove people into such a frenzy? The beauty of tulips was incredible. I'm going to make a second case. This is wild rice. This is a picture that I took in uh, the steppe hills of Jorhat in Assam. Now, this is how rice looks like. You know, the wild rice that if you were to not cultivate it would look something like this. But a viral infection, in fact, repeated viral infections several thousand years ago or, or tens of thousand years ago caused the spikelets of rice to come together and start to ripen at the same time. Now think about it. If uh, rice grains uh, started to mature and ripen at different types, it would be so difficult for us to harvest it. We would get uh, unripe rice and some uh, you know, small rice. Uh, some was hard, some was soft, some was uh, overripe. But you know, when we, the rice that we get in our farms now is rice which, is, uh, which ripens all together. Right? So, and it also is bunched together because that makes harvesting much simpler. The, you can see the difference between the physiology of the two plants. Right? And I also want to bring to your notice that a devastating fungal infection in the 1930s in America caused the decline of uh, these uh, uh, giant trees called the American chestnut. Just to give you a scale, uh, on the bottom right of this gray picture, you can see a, a large car. So you can make out what a big forest this was. And it appears as if the forest has caught fire and these are just the remains of the tree. Well, these trees are devastated by a fungus that, growed, that grew at the base of, uh, uh, of, the, of the tree. And it would actually collar and, and, and suffocate the tree, causing it to look like a ghost. But then in France and Italy, scientists noticed that a local variety of the European chestnut, which had a similar fungus affecting it, did not die, but it just survived barely. So there was a more virulent variety, which was orange in color. And there was a less virulent, a benign and a harmless version of fungus that did infect the tree, but it never killed it. In fact, the the tree, if it was infected by a less harmful fungus uh, of the same species, did not uh, uh, cause any harm and the tree actually flourished. So the scientists in Italy and France were trying to figure out that the same species of fungus, one uh, which is brilliant orange and in another tree, the same species is dull gray and it's small and withered. And in uh, the orange uh, fungus kills the tree uh, the gray fungus is barely surviving itself and the tree is flourishing. So what was the difference? So what they did was they tried taking the exudate of the gray uh, uh, benign uh, fungus and they put it on the orange, uh, the more virulent uh, fungus. And they found that the benign uh, fungus, the exudate from it would kill the orange one and make it into a gray one. It was discovered that the exudate contained a virus which could actually tame the virulent fungus. And this is something that they have been trying to use in back in America. And the, the American chestnut is now on a path of revival, at least in it's in its early days. And hopefully the fungus is not going to evolve a new strategy and evade the, the action of the virus. So I'm going to end by saying that what, what did I learn and about viruses and, uh, and you know, why did I do this uh, book, uh, especially when people were disturbed about how viruses is killing and decimating everyone around them. Well, I wanted to correct the narrative. Uh, first thing is that, you know, 
extinction is fine and lots of things, you know, for example, people started saying, let's eliminate all bats because they are spreading Nipah and uh, uh, Hendra and coronaviruses. So let's get rid of them. But when you look at things in perspective, nothing in nature is wasteful, right? Um, if you eliminate uh, uh, bats, chances are that you would also lose about 10 to 15% of all your fruit species. You know, they would go extinct. And they, they are vital fruits, tropical fruits. The, the worst thing that I noticed during the, uh, during the pandemic is that we started labeling everything as germs and bug and critter and slime and weed and gunk. You know, everything derogatory about microbes, you know. And I think that's wrong because I think I made five cases to you of why uh, funguses, uh, or oh, sorry, uh, virus, uh, viruses and microbes and funguses and bacteria and uh, protozoa and all of them are so important to the existence of life. They, all of these work together in different ways just because we don't under, understand the larger scheme of things of how these processes work. Uh, that does not mean uh, that their utility in the larger uh, realm of things is diminished. Uh, I would encourage everybody to question everything. I think we have to ask our scientists that, have you looked at this aspect of science? Uh, how do you know this? How, how, how do you know that it explains a certain natural phenomena? Uh, and the most important thing is we have to let our children and our students and everybody around us, stay curious. There's nothing like a stupid question. Keep asking your question till you're satisfactorily answered and, and assured that you now understand the whole picture of, um, of, uh, uh, of how things uh, work in nature. And I think it's a never-ending process. I think we need to understand nature better, uh, more profoundly. Only then can we get out of the problems that we've created for ourselves. Thank you so much. Jen? Hello, Jen? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was a wonderful lecture, and uh, it's the time for us to proceed with our questions. Um, those who have got, uh, got questions, you can put it in the chat box. Otherwise, you can raise your hand. So let us start with uh, the question that is raised by hand. Aditya Verma, you can go ahead and ask your question. You can unmute and ask your question. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you for uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lal about I mean, uh, very thought-provoking uh, lecture. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, opening our eyes, saying that what we believe as us is only part of uh, the, I mean, uh, that is uh, microbes and other bacteria and virus constitute more than our cells in our body. I, I just want to, I mean, I read somewhere that this, uh, uh, the, in the uh, evolution of in the evolution process, the uh, living organisms migrated from uh, or changed from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction as a, I mean, strategy uh, against the microbes. I just want to, you to elaborate, if possible, in uh, shortly. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Varma. Um, I have not really given it a thought, but I think, uh, you know, uh, I will, you know, start asking some people who um, specialize on reproduction. And let me see, that's a very good, question i don't uh, uh, i've not really thought of it and i think you've asked you've actually set me off in a direction where i should start thinking about it and maybe you and i should talk about this separately i'll be very interested in knowing what your thoughts are i frankly don't have uh, uh, any clue but maybe uh, three or four years down the line when i've started to read enough um, perhaps i will i may have some answers I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. Oh, it's okay. I mean, just, I mean, I am not a doctor. I am a banker, basically. 
Okay. So, okay. Uh, it's a very good question. It's a but, fantastic uh, question. Thank you. But so only, much. I mean, I have, I keep my interest in science and uh, try to. Right. Uh, it's a very good question, uh, Doctor uh, Mr. Verma. Thank you. Next, I ask uh, Hema Prabha to uh, ask your question. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for an amazing lecture and a wonderful book. I have uh, read this book and I was also amazed by various facts, including uh, how bacteriophages being in the holiness of the river Ganga. Uh, I'm a science communicator in Tamil. Although my area of research is electronics, I try to communicate viruses because of the pandemic. I have a question very specific to deforestation and uh, pandemic. Like, I, I understand uh, broadly that uh, because of deforestation, the viruses have evolved to, uh, which are supposed to be in the wild, have evolved to infect uh, humans and uh, species. But uh, I cannot uh, uh, try to get, I cannot get the information more than that or uh, anything specific. So I'll be happy to hear about uh, deforestation and uh, pandemic and uh, how the microorganisms evolve to uh, infect uh, humans. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's, uh, you know, it borders on a bit of uh, a lot of uh, oversimplification and a bit of myth. Let me try yeah. clarifying. So okay. what happens is that, you know, once you start felling trees or expanding agriculture and there are animals that would naturally reside in the forests, for example, bats or baboons or even uh, in Massachusetts, for example, now you see uh, red deer, which uh, carry a disease called the Lyme disease, right? Which is a tick-borne okay. disease, right? It's coming out. Yeah. So the point that I'm making here is that the microbe is not directed towards human. You know, it's a complete chance event. You know, even the coronavirus is a complete chance event. We found bat bats and civet cats that we have been, as we as in the human community, I'm not going to name countries or people but you know we've been doing that for a very long time and you know it's a chance encounter that SARS uh, the original SARS of uh, you know the first SARS or MERS or SARS-CoV-2 have jumped from a animal host which should not have been the case I mean the animals should be living in the forest and humans should not be living in uh, in such close proximity such with these animals right so the fact that we are creating or reducing barriers with what nature had actually created for us is a disturbing uh, thing. The second thing, like I mentioned, is that like evolution, the whole process of uh, the emergence of any new fevers is a completely random process. We can't say that, uh, you know, uh, or we can't even predict how uh, future diseases are going to emerge. We may know that uh, certain bacteria and viruses have the ability to infect human beings and in the future may become potential uh, pathogens or even uh, become uh, ep epidemics. But, uh, and we know this for a fact because there were certain bacteria in the 1930s and 40s that were considered to be uh, potential pathogens. And in 1990s and 2000s, they are full-blown pathogens. One example is Acinetobacter baumini about which I write in my book. Right. Yeah. So the fact yeah. is that it is our interventions and our transgression of nature, how we abuse nature, how we continue to poke at nature, that the, the virus or the bacteria is, is just inhaled and encountered. And we and that's it. We get it. And we become the replicators of those viruses or, or, or pathogens. And we start spreading it around. Um, you know, it, it's a complete uh, random event in which diseases cross over from one host into another. I hope I've been able to answer your question. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Improba. I ask Mr. Sri Ramajayam, the next to, to ask the question. Uh, good evening, sir. Hmm. I'm Sri Ramajayam from Pache Pass College. I have a doubt, sir, uh, that uh, like um, in the last two years, we humans uh, face that uh, corona effect, sir. Like uh, we are. Uh, uh, agriculture background, sir. So we face another problem that today, like needling virus, that uh, lumpy skin disease virus, sir, uh, in our uh, uh, cactus. On that virus, there is any ongo ongoing researchers, sir, uh, there, sir? Like yeah, good question. 
yeah. so spreads to one animal to animal by sneezing coughing that like only it uh, spreads sir in not right. going to sir that sir in that neatening virus yeah that's a good question i think um, you know a lot of very important zoonotic or uh, animal diseases are currently not give, being given enough attention so yeah. the funding is very very um, uneven uh, so yeah. i think you raise a very important point i mean there's some uh, serious diseases that need to be addressed urgently and uh, i don't think we've done enough and i think uh, uh, there is there are revisions the current government is looking into it and i think uh, we are hopeful that you know we come up with Uh, important uh, protocols especially one health protocols you know what yes, uh, i think uh, what uh, uh, the previous uh, uh, question that was asked by him prabha was also about one health that how is it that we can now look at uh, mm-hmm. environmental health and human health and animal health uh, and in complete sense planetary health to look at uh, you know so that there's well being of all so i think that is something that needs uh, policy and programs and more importantly investment and intent and what happens is we get policies and programs but no investment or intent from uh, bureaucrats or politicians and i think that's where we are lacking and i think you raise a very important point uh, yes sir yes sir thank you sir the lecture also very good sir thank you sir so before we move to the next uh, participant now i appeal all the participant to fill up the feedback form i also provide the link for the feedback form in the chat box also have the link for the the current lecture youtube lecture so you can note down or you can save it in your device so that you can see it in future again it's an excellent lecture and i also provide the uh, the link for the all lectures of psl we have have 47 lectures all lectures are placed in the youtube and you can you can play with it and um, is lecture i provide the link for that and also provide the feedback form please fill up the feedback from before you leave and you leave your contact details so that we can make you as a member of our google group so that you can get our um, uh, the noti- future notification of us so let uh, let us go to mr g partha sarathi uh, um, namas can you hear me sir yes uh, dr uh, uh, professor partha sarathi please uh, go ahead uh, pranay sir is a fantastic lecture thank you sir beautiful lecture i am from bangalore i am a physicist uh, but i had a small doubt uh, and the lecture said something called great oxidation event yes around 2 to 2.5 billion years old that's right and the sea the first life is formed at sea only correct so when the sea is formed when when did the seas form uh, and how, 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 how the creatures in the bottom of the sea got oxygen okay uh, so uh, a good question sir uh, yes, i sir. don't think you have read my book uh, have you read my book indica uh, no 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 no, no sir no, no no sir i just listened to your lecture ah, so okay. what you were nicely so, sparing yeah. so the great oxidation event does not mean that uh, the water was hypooxygenated what it meant is that the oxygen uh, availability because which was coordinated by the stromatolites and the uh, blue green uh, bacteria was so immense that it caused um, the uh, the metals uh, especially the metal ions to become oxidized and if you uh, i know you don't live too far from chitradurga so there is a place near if you go to chitradurga the town of chitradurga before you reach the fort on the right hand side there is a beautiful rock please go yes. and look at it it looks like a black and red raspberry jam uh, uh, you know look at it closely and you will see it's a very beautiful rock it's got iron um, uh, uh, oxide and it's got I- iron dioxide yeah. right? it's a ba- ba- banded iron formation banded iron yes that's yeah. right yeah. so yeah. so and there are several other formations i mean the banded iron is the most form uh, com- i mean the most famous of the uh, yeah. formations there are several others you have calcium silicate and cal- calcium si- trisilicates yeah. so um, what i'm trying to say here is that it was the mineral evolution that got uh, you know was sped up at the time of uh, between 2.7 to about uh, 700 billion years ago so seven uh, sorry 700 uh, million. 700 yeah. million years ago now 750 million years ago there was a volcanic act event called the malani volcanic event near jodhpur yeah. 
and that caused the defreezing of the earth it was one of the three big volcanic activities so again i'm sorry i'm bringing you to my book uh, indica if you were to read it you will get okay. uh, geological um, signatures that you can see around your homes in fact even on your table top you know your kota stone or your sandstones and your marbles how to how to look at a marble and say you know from which area it is you know and i can tell you uh, so all those kind of tricks and are there in my book and uh, the great oxygen uh, oxygen oxidation event uh, especially the one described by hoffman and in india by uh, you know several other scientists uh, i have described it in my footnotes uh, and also in forms of pictures so you will enjoy the book if you are interested in the great oxidation event thank you thank you so much sir we'll next move to usha ramachandra please ask your questions you can unmute and ask a question uh my question is uh, whether you have come across any reference where a plant virus has uh, uh, infected animals yeah that's a very yes. good question that's a very good question um so uh um, now in case of viruses uh there are um, no uh, there is i mean i have not come across an evidence where there is a persistent infection in humans or in animals uh but i know of a bacteria it's called ervinia um uh and i uh, if you were to go to uh, the ic uh, sorry the um uh, uh burgi's manual i don't know are you a microbiologist by any chance because then i can give you the reference uh no okay so there is some something called the burgi's manual and if you know, know any microbiologist ask them for uh, a burgi's manual i think it's in volume 2 you need to look for an organism called ervinia it's named after a scientist called ervin e r w i n i a ervinia some of them are known to cause mild stomach infection in humans and it is a as a persistent uh, uh, uh disease in plants so yeah that's perhaps the only one that i think uh, can cause uh, uh you know across plants and animals oh no no i was asking about uh, about viruses which infect plants whether you have come across any such viruses infecting animals or humans i mean viruses that infect plants and hum and animals or humans yes that's no. what i was asking no you none yet none, like none yet are you aware of any i i couldn't see no, i no i'm I not that's why i must yeah no i'm i'm not aware of any no okay thank you thank you so we have one question in the chat box which is given by asked by mr bharat um can i read it or you can read and answer the question uh okay um uh it is told that many viruses have been frozen in himalayas and in the poles because of climate change the virus may evolve to us what do you say about that okay so in it's i mean yeah it could be in any frozen condition if you have uh, uh, you know a creature that died i mean the whole idea comes from uh, you know certain carcasses that were discovered in the permafrost in siberia and when they started to analyze the the tissues they found the viruses to be infective so there is a possibility that some of these infective viruses can bounce back yes uh, but they have to be handled carefully would they uh, uh, i mean do they have a pandemic potential individually as viruses yes but uh, it would be very very bad handling uh, by anthropologists or scientists themselves if they use the tissues and let that uh, microbe spread so i'm hopeful that there are there are precautions taken by scientists as they find carcasses which may still have viable microbes in them i'm just hopeful because uh, we are going to start seeing as the permafrost and the ice in different uh, uh, landscapes uh, including the himalayas Uh, i have not come across the himalayan example uh, uh, bharat but uh, i know that permafrost uh, mastodons and uh, uh, have uh, uh, you know uh, a variety of bacteria and viruses that i know about yeah thank you sir um, so i think we covered all the questions it's the time to wind up uh, okay. dr jam or dr sk you want to 
add anything on this meeting uh no uh, i think uh, it's been an excellent talk and uh, i'll just be making it uh, <laughs> i don't i think uh, it, uh, as uh, expected it was uh, you know a perspective a big uh, picture perspective that uh, pranay lal is uh, known for and uh, i only hope that he will continue to associate uh, uh, himself with tamil nadu science forum and maybe also write for our uh, children's uh, magazine jantar mantar uh, so that will be a good uh, exercise and uh, uh, it's been an extremely uh, wonderful talk as can be seen from all the chat box uh, messages and thank you pranavar for this uh, exquisite uh, talk Thank you so much, sir, for having me, yeah. and thank you, TNSF. Yeah. Uh, um, Jam, uh, Jam, do you want to have to say anything? I'm good. It's mute. You are in mute. Okay. Ah. Uh, so thank you sir on behalf of tamil nadu science forum i'll be thanking you we will have a formal thank you um, thank giving things uh, will be done by sella kumar i have a, another demand from you and we want to have one more lecture from you on your book indica so we'll be approaching you again uh, so with this let me ask mr sella kumar to give the vote of thanks a uh, good evening everybody <clears throat> on behalf of the popular science lecture of tamil nadu science forum i extended my thanks to our respected speaker mr pranay lal to take out time from his busy schedule to grace the event thank you sir thank you for your excellent interesting lecture about the invisible empire a special thanks to dr t r govindarajan dr r ramanujam and dr s krishna swami for provide providing immense support to make the webinar successful i extended my thanks to mr vijayan and mr sundar and all my colleagues in psl executive committee to organize this webinar successful i must thank to the audience for listening the webinar their cooperation thank you everyone once again for making it great success have a great weekend thank you thank you sir Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.